All right, so welcome back everyone who's watching this later on Moodle for some reason that you couldn't join the stream. So um, Cluster W, like I told you, most popular multiple alignment tool today. Multiple alignment, unlike um, a pairwise alignment, is not a solved thing. Um, there's multiple alignment software tools being created um, and every year new tools come out which are either slightly better than cluster w um, one of them which i really like nowadays is muscle because it's very very fast um, so if you want to do multiple pairwise alignment um, or uh, multiple alignments then do look around what the latest state of the art is but i think cluster w because it's the the first one that really was out there is one which is really nice to describe and it's easy to describe because it's actually only has three steps. All right, so how does it work? So step number one is constructing the pairwise alignments, right? So hey, it, it, what you do is you line, align each sequence to each other given a similarity matrix, right? And the similarity can be described as, for example, the exact match is divided by the sequence length. And normally you would use a very, uh, you would use a more like a, a more proper algorithm, things that have like gap opening or or penalties like a fine gap um, scoring yeah, but the idea is is that when you have four sequences sequences one to four yeah, of course the sequences are always 100 percent similar to themselves so the the, the um, diagonal of the matrix doesn't matter um, but here we have for example a matrix and here, here dot 17 means that they are 17 percent identical so what we do is this is step one is we just do this pairwise alignment between all of the sequences which is computationally expensive but but hey, if you would use something like BLAST or um, some other step or some other optimized algorithm, this is perfectly doable and it doesn't matter. So what you then do in the next step is you use this matrix uh, to create a, because this uh, the, the guide tree is based on the similarity matrix. Hey, so you use the neighbor joining method and the guide tree roughly reflects evolutionary relationships. So for this little matrix that we have here, hey, of course, uh, V1 and V3 are highly similar, so they are branched together. And hey, then we have uh, V4, hey, which is um, very similar to V1 and V3. But the way that it does this is it first finds the two which are most similar, right? So V1 and V3. So it makes the alignment from V1 and V3, and this is called V1-3. So we create a new sequence, which is more or less the consensus sequence between V1 and V3. And then what we do is we then align the consensus sequence against all of the other ones in the matrix. So the matrix becomes smaller. Do I have a step for that? No, I have a step. Um, so I have an example. But hey, then hey, the consensus sequence is aligned against V4, creating a new sequence, which is build up of our one, two, three, uh, one and three and four, and then you align this new sequence against V2, the last and the most distant sequence, and then you get your V, uh, you get your your alignment for that. And so you start by aligning the two most similars, then you follow the guide tree, add in the next sequence to the existing alignment, and you insert gaps as necessary um, to to make things work. So the example, imagine that these are the four sequences that we have on, 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 uh, on, on just letters, right? So we're not dealing with proteins or anything. Um, have, but first we do the uh, pairwise alignment. So we do sequence one versus sequence zero, sequence one versus sequence two, um, and, and so on. So we create the matrix of the pairwise alignments. Um, why did this zero, why this is nine, four and seven, I don't know. There was a rationale when I ma when I made this example, but that just assumed that I calculated the scores correctly. So we build a neighborhood joining three, and which shows you that sequence one and sequence three are most similar. So here I'm actually doing it the other way around. So a distance of nine means that they are highly dissimilar, and a distance of four means that they are very similar. Right. So we create a neighbor joining three, which is always a rooted tree. So it starts with uh, uh, root and then have based on the distances between the sequences we cluster things together and so from this we learn that s2 and s4 are very similar to each other while s1 and s3 are very similar to each other but these two groups are very dissimilar from each other um, which you can more or less see in the uh, in the alignment as well 
Yeah, and then what you do is you then do your alignment step. So you first do aligning, uh, you first start aligning S1 with S3, then you align S2 with S4, and then you align the two kind of branches from the three together, and then hit because of this you then end up with your multiple sequence alignment. So it's it's just an example to kind of show that you hey you calculate the distances, you make a tree and then with the tree you start doing the alignment pairwise. All right, so when cluster W gives you the output, then it has an additional line underneath where it tells you what is going on, right? So if the, the line underneath has a star, that means that this column of the alignment contains identical amino acid residues in all sequences or identical bases if you do DNA sequence alignment. If you have these double point, then that means that the column contains the alignment different but highly conserved, very similar amino acid. A dot means that there is somewhat of a conservation going on and when there's nothing it means that there are dissimilarities or gaps there. Um, so hey, if you would for example look at uh, histone H1 hey, then what you would see is that if you take mouse, uh, human, mouse, rat, cow and chimp hey, you would see that there's a whole bunch of stars right and the stars are um, the ones which are identical. Right, so the sequence here is very identical, so there's a high likelihood that this, that the identical pieces are carrying some kind of a, um, of, a, of a function and that this function is shared and without having this function you cannot function as, as, a, as a histone. Then you see that there are double points, so here you see an S, A, A, A and S and these are um, amino acids speaking very similar to each other and so this is then deemed as being conserved. Yeah, here you see uh, leucine and then uh, uh, phenylalanines, which are very different amino acids. So this part of the, the protein is not conserved. Yeah, and you see a part here which is also not conserved. Yeah, so if you would do like large alignments, yeah, then you would see that if you would do similar proteins across different species, yeah, then you can figure out which part of the protein is probably things like the active site or where you can target a drug to kind of target this protein. Yeah, so this is more or less the same thing what, what you can do with, uh, with things like viruses. So if you have multiple viruses like flu viruses, hey, you just, uh, uh, so you take the influenza virus, hey, you take for example the uh, hemagglutinina spike and you, you take this spike across like different versions um, and then you can see that parts of the spike are very conserved and so these parts are functionally necessary for the spike of the influenza virus to, fi uh, to, uh, to, to work. So there is of course a pitfall when you do multiple sequence alignment which is not really there when you do kind of local or uh, when you do uh, blast searches. So when you do a cluster W search um, the multiple sequence alignments always work on the, the assumption that you are giving it related sequences. So it will align anything even if they have nothing to do with each other. So if I just take two completely different proteins from two completely different species and I throw them into an MSA algorithm, then the MSA algorithm will give me an alignment. Even if these sequences are completely unrelated, it will try to do its best because hey, the assumption here is, is that you know what you are doing as a, as a biologist hey, and you want to align these sequences together so you probably have a good reason to do this. Hey, but the rule of thumb is that if it looks wrong it probably is because multiple sequence alignments unlike uh, pairwise alignments they don't give you things like an e-value to evaluate how good the alignment is. Um, so hey, always when you do multiple sequence alignment be aware that if you are aligning trash with trash or two things which are not related to each other hey, then the, the, the result will be meaningless although you will get a result hey, which is different from many algorithms um, hey, for example in pairwise sequence alignment um, it will it will give you an alignment and then it will tell you well the e-value of this alignment is um, one right so this alignment is is just random. Um, but multiple sequence alignment doesn't do that. It doesn't give you an e-value. Um, so hey, you have no idea how good the alignments are. Um, but of course if you see something like this where there's massive conserved regions then you can think yeah this is a pretty good alignment. Um, but hey, it's, it's very difficult. And so for example uh, one of the pitfall examples which occurs a lot hey, is that for example if you have um, um, the alignment of uh, the fat cat 
Garfield the very fast cat, Garfield the, the fast cat, and Garfield the last fat cat, and then it will try to do its best to do the alignment, and but you can see that in this case and the alignment goes completely wrong, because here um, having the word cat last would result in three um, positions which are conserved, um, but because of the way that the alignment works and it tries to align the sequences which are uh, the most similar first, right, it will actually align cat with fat, right, because now this will introduce one mismatch um, and then at the end it will have uh, three gaps, but these three gaps at the end are not uh, not as um, influential as this, uh, they, this, is, this is more yeah, so so it, it's just a better alignment. But because you start with the wrong alignment in the first step, because these two sequences, it will actually go wrong when it starts aligning the other ones as well. So in the end you get an alignment yeah, which is not really representative of the best multiple sequence alignment that you could get. So yeah, be aware that that's always one of these issues with multiple sequence alignment. So there's a lot of different multiple sequence alignment tools out there. So you have Cluster W, which was invented in 1994. You have HMMT, which uses an HMM technology, which was developed in 1995. You have P PRRP, which I never used. Um, I used Muscle a lot, and I'm still using that a lot. Um, it's developed like 10 years after Cluster W, but it's um, it's more optimized and it, it's relatively fast compared to Cluster W. And of course you have the new version of Cluster W which was done like five years ago, um, so like 2014, 2015 when they renamed it Cluster Omega and improved the, the underlying algorithm. Yeah, but just to give you an overview, every year um, new multiple sequence alignment tools will be produced. So when you start doing multiple sequence alignments, it really pays off to read through the literature to see what people are using currently. And, and generally what people are using en masse is the one which is currently best. Yeah, but of course all of these algorithms were invented and then people continuously update them. So uh, the, the best alignment tool changes every year um, and that's that's just the way that it is. All right, so structural alignments, are, it's the third part of how you can align. It uses information about the secondary and tertiary structure of a protein or an RNA molecule to aid in alignment of the sequence. And so protein and RNA structure is more evolutionary conserved than the sequence. And we already saw that with our little example that we did before, and where you look at the conservation based on DNA level and protein level. So often proteins are much more conserved, so the, the, the amino acids are more conserved than the DNA coding for these amino acids. This has to do with, of course, the third base pair, the wobble base, hey, which is free to choose in many cases, or relatively free to choose. And so mutations in the third base pair of the DNA codon are not as impactful because they generally don't change the, uh, the, the protein. And so uh, if you would look at, um, hey, if you would think about this then of course like the, the protein is more conserved than the DNA sequence so protein sequence is more conserved than DNA sequence but not only that but the structure right so the, the way that it folds is even more conserved because the, 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 the function of a protein is based on how it folds and where kind of the active site is in which amino acids are coding for that. Yeah, but since the structure is more conserved, you nowadays have tools like DALI and SSAP, um, which, which use um, this information about structure um, to kind of inform the alignment tools uh, which alignment is to be preferred. Yeah, so DALI is a fragment-based method for constructing structural alignments based on contact similarity patterns between successive hexapeptides in the query sequence. So here this hexapeptide is more or less like the camerization which we saw on DNA level when you do a uh, blast, um, but had these hexapeptides are, um, are assigned a kind of structural similarity score. Yeah, so based on three pept or three um, amino or six amino acids, hexapeptides are six amino acids in a row, um, hey, it will get a structural score and if two things are structural scores very similar, hey, then that will be preferentially in alignment. Uh, then you have SSAP which is um, 
more or less the same, but it uses atom to atom vectors in a structure space as comparison points. And so this is more or less when when you have a protein sequence um, which for which the structure is more or less solved and then they know what the distance is between the individual atoms and then that is used when you query your new sequence for uh, for alignment. Um, but these are relatively new tools and they perform slightly better uh, than standard pairwise alignment for uh, for things like using a Bloser matrix. Um, but uh, be aware that this is a very active field of research and this is something where uh, if you are interested in bioinformatics you can contribute a lot in the, in the next five to, to ten years. Alright, so then the almost last topic of today, there's one more topic after this, is uh, motifs. So motifs are a way for a computer to be able to find things like transcription factor binding sites in the DNA. So there are um, different representations of DNA motifs, so you have the string representation, you have the matrix representation, and then you have a representation with nucleotide dependency, and the third one is the best one, but also the most complex one to implement. So there's not a lot of tools out there which use the nucleotide dependency, uh, a representation with nucleotide dependency. But we will go through the different DNA motifs or storing of DNA motifs and how to use them. And so the string representation is just basically you have a string of characters and these string of characters, um, um, had, for example, the Tata box, which is T-A-A, T-A-T-A-A, uh, -T -A -A, that can be represented using a string motif because you are always looking for more or less the T-A and then T-A-A. -A. So you can use wildcard symbols to use choice at a certain position. And so for a Tata box, if I would have a um, if I would have a string representation of a Tata box, then that would look more or less somewhat like this. Um, so it would be a, first a T, then an A, then a T, then an A, and the last A is not always an A. So hey, it could be an A or a C, for example. So what you then do is you, you make this a wildcard, and the wildcard is an A to C, and an A to C, when you look at uh, EUPAC coding, do I have EUPAC coding? Yes. So uh, an A or a C is actually called an M. Right? So this would then be the search string that you use to search for a Tata box yeah, because it always would have Tata, this is guaranteed, but here at this position an A matches and a C matches as well. Right, so it's just a string and you use the EUPAC coding and so the EUPAC coding has for all the different um, the different positions, yeah, it has a uh, it has a, a base pair. Yeah, so for example you can have like a pyridine, that's why it's called R, so A or G is it, yeah, because both A and G are purinous, um, they use the letter R for it. If you have a C or a T, those are both pyrimidinous, so you will use the Y for that. And then you have strong, yeah, so these have the C or the G, both of them have three amino acid bindings, so that's why it's called, uh, they both both the C and the G have three hydrogen bridges, um, so that's why they're called strong. Then you have weak, so W, A and T, because of the fact that they have two hydrogen bridges holding them together. Um, then you have G or, G or T, which are the Cato, and you have A and C, which are the amino, and then of course you have not A, not C, not G, and not T. And so you can use this coding to build up a string, a search string, to search through the DNA to figure out where a certain protein might be able to bind. Um, and so you can use wildcards or you have a choice from the symbols at a particular position. And of course this works very well for DNA. Uh, for, for proteins this is not, not available at the moment as far as I am aware. So the, mat the, the matrix representation of a positional weight matrix is more or less what many people nowadays are used to. Um, and uh, the positional weight matrix or PWMs or position specific scoring matrix called PSSM, uh, they assume independence between the positions in the pattern and they represent it by a matrix or viewed as a sequence logo. Uh, so here you have a position frequency matrix, right? So you have, for example, observed um, 31 um, or, yeah, so you have observed uh, 31 bindings of a protein to a piece of DNA, and 
out of these 31 bindings that you observed, um, 28 times there was a C at the first position. Two times there was a T and one times there was an A at the first position. Right, and then so here you can see that the C is the most is is the conserved residue at the first position, although it not all it it's not always a C, right? And the same thing holds for the second position, the third position, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. And so if you do an experiment where you, for example, do a pull down experiment, so you you make an antibody which targets a DNA binding protein, and then what you do is you have the protein is bound to the DNA and then what you do is you, you digest the DNA which is not bound by the protein and then you pull down these pieces of DNA which you sequence. So and then in the end hey, you would have 31 different sequences because this protein bound at 31 positions in the genome and then from this you can then build this um, the sequence logo and in the sequence logo you can see that yeah almost always the first position is a C the fourth position is always or almost always a T and then the second and third positions predominantly are a T um, and the, the, the fifth position is predominantly a G so this is this is how these things are built and these are very useful when you want to score um, for example uh, does this transcription factor binding site bind near my gene or does it have the ability to bind because a computer can use these position frequency matrices to kind of scan the DNA and say well here there's a high match to the frequency matrix that you gave me so there's a high likelihood of the protein being able to bind here and of course different proteins have different binding motifs and so the Tata box the, the one which is bound by um, the polymerase or the start of the polymerase head that is TATA um, and that will that will have its own binding motif, while other proteins that bind DNA will have different motifs. So how do you do that? Yeah, so when you create a position frequency matrix, you count for each position the number of A, C's, T's, and G's that you found. For example, during a pull-down experiment, and then yeah, from this you generally create a position probability matrix. Yeah, so you divide each column by the PFM by the number of observations. Yeah, so this would just mean that yeah, the first column gets divided by 31. The second column gets divided by 5, nine, also 31. And this one gets divided by 31 as well. And that, that is called then a position probability matrix. So instead of having the frequencies of how often you observed it, you have the probability of observing a certain base pair. And then you want to create this position weight matrix. So for every entry in the table, you calculate the log 2 of the PFM uh, divided by the BI. And the BI is the occurrence of a base pair in random DNA. Right, because if you are looking um, at a certain bacteria which has an 80% GC content, right? So at every base pair position, you have an 80% chance of finding a C or a G. Of course, you want to compensate for that eh, when you are scanning using your position weight matrix. Um, and so that's just the way that it works. And so of course, the BI is the occurrence of a base pair in random DNA. And so you, you calculate the log 2 of the certain position. And so in this case, you would, you would say that this is 28 divided by um, 31. And then you would take the log 2 of 28 divided by 31. Um, or, so you would, you would take the log 2 of 28 divided by 31 and then you divide that by the GC content. So if you have a high GC content you would penalize against finding a C there um, and increase the score of things like A's and T's. And this is done because every animal has a different GC content and you have to compensate for the GC content when building these matrices otherwise they, they go more or less haywire. Alright, so hey, if you look at this, then of course we, we assume that if there is a C at the first position, there has to be a G at the fifth position. This is not captured by these position frequencies or these position weight matrices at all. Because these, these weight matrices assume that every observation of each is independent, right? Hey, but here, hey, there might be some kind of a dependence, because we see that if you see a T here, then there's also a T very likely here. Hey, but if there's a C at this position, hey, then we see also five observations of a C here. So it might be that these two locations are actually kind of linked together, hey, so that the, the 
protein when it binds a T it also needs to bind a T at the next position when it binds a C at the second position it needs to bind a C at the third position as well so uh, this is not you can't catch this using this uh, PWM um, so nowadays hey you have these uh, nucleotide dependency relationships hey, where people assume that the bases in the motif are not dependent to each other hey, for example if you have an A on position 1 then you need a G on position 5 and then you use this position or this scored position specific patterns and this is again very complex not a solved issue and is again something which hey, in the coming like 10 years um, some smart guy will figure out how to best represent this using computers and hey, this will be an enormous um, uh, boost in the efficiency in in how to find uh, well positions which the, in which the DNA can be bound by different proteins um, but th there's a lot of smart people working on these scored position specific patterns um, but it's not a not a solved issue at all all right, so if you are interested in DNA motifs, for example, you have a gene and you want to know, is this gene regulated by uh, growth hormone or is this gene regulated for um, a, another transcription factor binding site? And then there are two major databases with motifs. Um, in our group, we always used to use Transfac. It is the largest repository of transcription factor binding sites, um, but it is commercial and it only has a small public database. Um, so it's only commercial since like seven, eight years. So before that, everyone would use Transfac, but since they wanted to make money out of Transfac, they made it commercial, so you have to buy a license, and this license is relatively expensive. Um, so because of that, um, after Transfac went commercial and needed a license to be able to use the database, um, people started this open source database called JASPAR. And JASPAR uh, is a really, really good database. Um, it contains transcription factor binding sites, so it, hey, you can download position weight matrices there for things like growth hormone or um, hey, all kinds of other things that bind DNA. Um, and it provides an API for R. So from R, you can directly query the YASPAR database and you can directly load in uh, the, the position weight matrices um, and, and these kinds of things. So finding motifs, have, finding motifs is done by phylogenetic footprinting because binding uh, sites tend to be conserved in evolution. So you can use DNA sequences from multiple species, align them together, and use multiple sequence, align them. And if you have, so if you have a homologous gene, for example, myostatin, and what you do is you take the 5,000 base pair upstream of myostatin in 10 or 20 different animals, and then you you look to see if there's any conserved pattern which is 5 to 15 bases long because 5 to 15 bases hey you know that a single uh, a single kind of wounding of a dna helix is 4.6 base pairs and most of the transcription factor uh, the, most of the transcription factors they bind either in a single helical turn or they bind up to 3 sing uh, or up to 3 helical turns in a go and so when you are looking for transcription factor binding sites what you do is you take the upstream region of for example myostatin then you align these in as many species as you can find that have myostatin and then hey you just do multiple sequence alignment and you look to see if there's any region 5 to 15 base pairs long which is conserved between species and this is because something like myostatin is regulated by um, hormones which which are targeting like muscle development and of course these hormones are shared between many different species and just like proteins and protein functions are conserved hey you can use this homology trick as well to find uh, motifs which are which are conserved there are many many different tools available so if you want to find motifs and sequences, then and there's all of these like meme and align ace and motif voter and gip sampler and, and all of these tools you can use to find motifs um, in um, upstream regions of genes or in downstream regions of genes. And if you have a motif, then you can do transcription factor binding site searches. And of course there, there's a lot of databases and a lot of tools out there which can do that for you as well. So just an overview with, with links. Um, if you ever need to find a transcription factor binding site, then hey, just come here or come to the slide, click a link and then hey, go to the database. 
All right, so some other fields of application where uh, we use sequence analysis. Hey, of course, sequence analysis is used a lot in genome assembly. Um, also, when we do RNA sequencing, we need to align sequences to the genome. And uh, when we do, for example, population SNP discovery, so single nucleotide polymorphisms in a population, then we also use sequence alignment. So sequence alignment is really fundamental in all of the things that we do in bioinformatics. Um, here I only want to talk about genome assembly. Um, have when you do RNA sequencing, have then have you, you sequence RNA molecules and then you use a tool like BLAST to blast the RNA sequence back to the genome and this allows you to locate where the introns are located, so the, the protein coding parts of the gene and where the, uh, the, where the exons are located, the protein coding parts, and where the introns are. So the introns are the parts which are spliced out, which are not coding for protein. Hey, and you get information about things like alternative splicing. So you get an idea of how many different proteins are produced from a single gene. Um, and when you do population level SNP discovery, hey, you do sequence alignment as well. And since you're looking at a population which is, for example, humans, hey, then you can see that, oh, all humans have more or less the same um, and they have the, the, a similar sequence, but at this position, and sometimes there's an A, uh, sometimes there's a T. So, But I wanted to talk a little bit more about genome assembly. So the novo genome assembly is, a, is more or less an, a non-solved problem as well, but it is a very interesting problem since there's very very good approaches on how to do this. Hey, it is the process of determining the DNA sequence composition of an organism, and there's two things that or there's two ways of doing this. Um, well, actually, nowadays there's a third one, but I don't intend to talk about it. But you can use whole genome sequencing, whole genome shotgun sequencing, which is just short read sequencing. So and we, we chop up the genome in very small pieces and we sequence all of these little fragments that we get. Um, this is the novel way of doing it. When people were doing the Human Gene Genome Project um, hey, on the universities, they actually used something which are bar uh, bacterial artificial chromosomes. And so what you would do is you would take like a large piece, like 15,000 base pairs of the DNA, right? So you would use um, restriction enzymes to cut part of the DNA out. Then you would use primers to amplify that. And then you would clone this piece into a vector, in a bacterial vector. Then the bacterial vector will replicate and then will make a lot of copies of this. And then you would then use something like Sanger sequencing to sequence this artificial bacterial chromosome. Um, we don't do that anymore because it's relatively, it's an old technique and it's very expensive compared to whole genome um, sequencing. Yeah, but if we talk about genome assembly, we're not talking about genome sequencing. Genome assembly is the computational step that follows genome sequencing with the objective of reconstructing the genome from its read. So how do we do that? So hey, if we have all of these short reads, like we have the different colored reads here, like this, this one in red and green and in blue, hey, what we look is we look to see if there's any overlap between the short reads. Um, when there are overlapping reads, we merge them into something called a contic, which is the black read here, right? So you can see here that the C, the A, the C, the A, the T, and the C, they match here, right? So we know that hey, this part, this read, plus this read, they belong together because of the fact that they are identical at this position. And so we know that after this C, we can use this read to just continue. Um, the same thing holds here, like this part of the green read is exactly identical to the red read. So we merge these into something as a contig, uh, which is called a contig. So a contig is a contiguous sequence built from small sequences. And so multiple contigs are usually connected together using things like scaffolds. So a scaffold links together a non-contiguous series of genomic sequences into a contiguous sequence separated by gaps of a certain known length. So the sequence that are linked are typically contiguous sequence, so contigs build up by overlapping reads. And so what you do is in the first step, you start and you look to all your reads to see which ones are overlapping and you build as sequences which are as big as possible that you can do. And then the next step is scaffolding. So the next step is kind of figuring out how these different contexts that you have, which have no overlap to each other, are more or less linked to each other in the genome. So how do you do that? So scaffolding um, can be created when you do paired end sequencing because paired end sequencing uses um, uh, like 
pieces of DNA which are around seven to eight hundred base pairs long and then you read the first 150 base pairs from the five prime in the forward direction and then you read from the same fragment you read the five prime in the in the reverse direction right so you get um, how this is done is more or less when you when you have your sequencer then in the sequencer uh, you make a library and the library looks it's kind of a um, yeah, so you have a spot on your sequencer and what happens is that these fragments of DNA are on there like little loops so what happens is is that the loop get, gets cut um, so the loop gets cut open and then it is read from bottom to top and it's read from bottom to top here so you get two sequences um, well that's really small actually so what happens is is when you when you do sequencing you have like these spots let me see yeah that's that's kind of visible and then you you attach DNA like this then this gets cut open and then you start sequencing from here and you start sequencing from here right so we now know that these 150 base pairs that we get from this we get 150 base pairs from here and we know now that in between there needs to be around 500 base pairs um, which we did not sequence because we cannot sequence them still really small but but what you then do is because of this pair then sequencing you now know that there are two reads right so what you have is you have for example contig one build out of overlapping reads right so here we see two reads which have overlapped to each other so we build a single contig out of them on here we see that we have another overlapping read system where we can figure out using the overlapping reads that these are contigs and then hey, we have like a paired and fragment hey, which we are lucky because the first part of the fragment falls in contact one the second part of the fragment falls in contact two so we now know that these two are more or less like an x number of base pairs apart hey, but we we do not know the sequence but we do know where they are on the genome. So this is how you go from having multiple or sometimes like thousands of little contigs into a genome hey, which is built up of um, more or less um, scaffolds. So scaffold for chromosome one, scaffold for chromosome two. All right, so that was everything for today that I wanted to tell you guys. So I told you today about genome annotation. I told you about the homology trick and why it works and that the this is something that we already know since Charles Darwin. Um, I told you about sequence alignment, so I told you about pairwise alignment, about substitution probabilities, so have that transversions and transitions in DNA make some changes in base pairs more likely than others, that the same thing happens when you look at proteins, so and that's why we have something like a Blossom matrix which assesses the likelihood of one amino acid being changed by another one. I told you about multiple sequence alignments, so that you can use cluster W or use muscle, yeah, kind of how these algorithms work so that they use like pairwise alignments followed by a guide tree method where the, the different sequences are more or less put in a tree and then kind of clustered together. And I told you that when you do multiple sequence alignments, you always have to be very, very careful f when you look at the results, right? Because if you if you take two proteins which have nothing to do with each other, or not two, but if you take like six proteins which have nothing to do with each other and you start multiple sequence alignment, then it can be that you get an alignment which is not meaning anything. I told you a little bit about structural alignment and that's, that's the new step more or less in, in sequence alignment where hey, you use information about the 3D structure or the secondary or tertiary structure of RNA or DNA of proteins to kind of guide the sequence alignment and so to have more information. I told you about DNA motifs and that um, you can use the JustBar database for free um, and get your motifs for a lot of known uh, DNA binding proteins there and I told you a little bit about genome assembly using whole genome sequencing and just so that you guys know when people talk about a contig and what is a contig so that's a contiguous read based off multiple little reads which all have overlaps and then and what is a scaffold a scaffold is when you combine multiple contigs together using this paired and sequencing technology where you know kind of 
two times sequence from the edges and you know that there's like 500 or 600 base pairs between these two reads um, and so that you can use that to couple these contexts together into uh, uh, scaffolds uh, which can then be used to reconstruct the whole genome. All right, so for me that's it for today. Um, or if there's any questions then um, please let me know um, either by email or you can throw them in chat directly. Um, and um, for the people watching on Moodle this is going to be the end of the lecture. So I will stop recording.